Good, thank you for joining us. Good to be staying in worship.
If you could fill that out, and you could just leave it on your seat, and an usher will get it at the end of service. I have a few updates. Uh, first, next Sunday, May 19th at 2 p.m., Mount Nebo will host a piano recital. Our pianist, Julianne Holbrook, will lead her students in sharing her musical talents. So everyone's invited next Sunday at 2 p.m. Also, don't forget uh, Mount Nebo's website to register your children and grandchildren for Vacation Bible School is open, so go there and get that done. Uh, this year, Vacation Bible School will be June 3rd through June 6th from 9 a.m. to noon. So the website's open. Be sure to go there and do that. Uh, next Sunday, during both worship services, we're going to recognize high school and college graduates connected to our graduation, so we hope you plan to attend and encourage them and uh, pray for them as, as they start the next chapter in their life. Um, back to Vacation Bible School, if you would like to donate some items for vacation, vacation Bible School, they're much needed. There are cards with items needed back there in the narthex on the table. Uh, so pick one up with some items you, you, you're, you're pledging to give to Vacation Bible School, and please bring them back by May 26th. Also, Elijah Ma Massengill, you guys know him, he's up here on our worship team, usually stands on this side. Well, his family invites you to celebrate with them on a graduation party, and it's May 19th, so next Sunday, from 2 to 7, and it's back here at the Pavilion at Mount Nebo. So please come and help them celebrate that graduation. And that's all I have. Have a blessed day. Great. Thank you, Bill. I have uh, spoken personally to several of the, you moms here, but for those I haven't, happy Mother's Day to all of you moms with us today. We certainly thank God for you and and uh, for the uh, the role that He He created you to serve in the in the family. We're we're so appreciative of of who you are. Hey, also today when you leave, our events ministry team has planned again this year to offer all you moms a, a, uh, a flower that you can take home and, and plant. And uh, not just for moms, but also all the women here today. Please pick up one of those and take those home and enjoy that this year. Just a little token of our appreciation for you. Now, I want to share one more thing before I lead us in prayer. And uh, that is regarding Jim Luckadoo's great-granddaughter, Jennifer, or her uh, Juniper Joe, where? We have a picture of her. And so uh, the picture on the left is actually when she was three months old. When she was born, you may remember, she weighed less than two pounds. The picture on the right is a recent picture. She weighs uh, over 11 pounds now and is now home. She got home from the hospital, Children's Hospital, just about a week or so ago. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't certain that she would even survive after being born so prematurely, but uh, she is doing well, and Jim wanted to share with all of you, thank you for your prayers for her uh, over the last several months, and uh, he, he wants to share just a praise to God for answering those prayers as he has chosen to do so, and this, this little one is home, and and doing well. We'll continue to pray for her as well. And, and one other praise to God. Uh, Mason Gardner, many of you know, he's been in Children's Hospital uh, for uh, a number of, of weeks with a serious lung infection. And, and he is home now. He's been home uh, not quite a week yet, just a few days, but he's home doing much better. He's still home. There's still more healing needs to take place. And so we're going to continue to pray for him. But praise God that, that he is home. So uh, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're grateful to you for, uh, you know, just your goodness to us. And part of your goodness to us, uh, you know, for all of us who have been blessed with good moms to be a part of our family is, is just that relationship you've blessed us with. And for those who, you know, maybe didn't, didn't have such a good relationship with mom for one reason or another. God, thank you for the other people that you probably added to their lives, substitutes in one way or another. God, we're grateful to you for the role that 
you've planned for mothers to have in our lives. God, thank you for your goodness to us in this way and many others for how well um, Juniper Joe is, is doing and the fact that Mason is doing better and able to be home. God, we thank you for these good, good things and pray for your continued healing touch for both of these persons. God, we just lift their names to you, uh, the creator of heaven and earth uh, and the one who uh, you know, is our great physician. Lord, continue to undertake for them, we pray. Father, we also want to, want to uh, uh, just thank you for uh, how you've walked with Chris Roy and her husband Jack at the loss of Chris's mom, Christine, Christine Ryan. Uh, she passed away this last week, and, and Lord, you know, she was a woman of deep and sincere faith. And so at 98 years old, Lord, you blessed her with a great homegoing where she went home to be with you. God, we're happy for her, but we pray for Chris and her family and hold them up and care for them during this time. <laughs> Lord, we uh, just pray, uh, you know, ahead for the graduate Sunday coming up this next week. And we ask for those graduates that you would begin even now to help them to sense <clears throat> the love of Jesus Christ, your son, uh, for them. And Lord, help them next week to sense the love of, your, of, of the church community for them as well and launch them into the next chapter of their lives with this assurance, with this truth, and the help of the Lord to rely on you in new and wonderful ways. Now, Lord, we ask again for your blessing upon the reading of Scripture today. Uh, Lord, we, we just pray that you would take your, your living word and apply it to our, our lives, awaken us from any spiritual slumber we may be in in, in these moments and, and make us alive uh, to, to you and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to your Word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, when, when we see needs, I, I think you would agree that the right thing to do is to take action. If we see a need, if we can do something about it, the right thing to do is to take action. Uh, I, I, as I thought about this, I, I thought about how God has seemed to equip most mothers and grandmothers to instinctively take action when they, when they see a need. And so I, I thought about, um, uh, you know, just years past and, and how life used to be when I was younger and years before. And so, for instance, I was thinking back to the days when cars did not have seat belts and did not have airbags. Never, never thought of. <clears throat> and, and before these safety devices were installed in cars, this is what the inside, I think this was an postal bill if I remember right, but you see that dashboard on that car? It is not padded. That is hard metal. And there was nothing to keep you from plowing into that if somebody hit the brakes really hard. And I remember as a little guy, and, and probably some of you, uh, being allowed to stand in the front seat and look out the window while my parents were driving. And if you stand in the, remember that? Stand in the front seat, look out the window, you know, just happy-go-lucky, not even think about the fact of what could happen when somebody applied the brakes too hard. But I know this, when my mom or grand, grandma were, were driving and they needed to hit the brakes instinctively, they knew the need and did something about it. Now I'm telling you, without even looking to the side, the arm went out. You know what I'm talking about? The arm went out and saved you from, <clears throat> you know, having a concussion from the contact with the dash of the car. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's a, a way that mothers and grandmothers, I, I saw that they take action when they see a need. <clears throat> I thought about this as well. The first emergency rooms were probably a mom's kitchen counter. You know, when there was a cut or a, a scrape or a burn or something like that. 
you, you'd go into the kitchen and mom and grandma would say, you know, come, come over here. And they'd pick you up and sit you on the kitchen counter. I remember kitchen counters that we had were those, those porcelain, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, po white porcelain counters and, and, and all of that. They, you know, I, I sat up on that thing more than, than once and, and, and mom would run and get a bottle of, little bottle of this or that. And I don't even know if it's, it's legal or not anymore, but it would be mercuricone, mephiolate, iodine, that kind of stuff. There was no neosporin kind of ointment. No, it was that sort of stuff. Or some little jar of salve that smelled something awful. And, and they would put that, put that on you. And, and I remember hearing the words, hold still. And the reason I was fidgety is because I knew it was going to burn like fire. But it only burned like fire until it stopped, right? Well, you know, or so when there was an emergency, a medical emergency, moms and grandmas took action. I also thought about the fact that the first internal medicine doctors were also most likely moms and grandmas. And here's how it worked. Oh, you know, oh, you don't, you don't feel good? Well, here, eat something. You'll feel better. You know, homemade this or that, right? Or you have a headache, uh, and they would probably feed you. Or, you know, you have some head congestion or some chest congestion, and, and, and you'd say, well, I don't feel like eating. And the words would come back, well, you'll never get better if you don't eat something, right? You have a fever, and it's like... Uh, Let's see, is it feed a cold and starve a fever or starve a cold and feed? It didn't matter. Mom and grandma, their answer was always to feed you. So they were kind of the first internal medicine doctors, weren't they? Dads were more likely to say things like, you know, suck it up. You'll get over it. Don't worry. Your skin will grow back. I've seen worse. You won't die. Or, hold on, let me get my pocket knife out. No, run! They were about to do surgery on you without anesthesia, right? But not moms. No, they, they would bust out everything in the medicine cabinet or cook something up to feed you. It seems that God has equipped mothers and grandmothers with an instinct to just take action to meet needs. Well, when, when followers of, of Jesus see needs, I think you'd agree that God wants us to take action. He wants the church to take action. The title of this message is The Church in Action. Of course, this series has been about how God has prepared Christians to make an impact in the world. And so the title of this whole sermon series is Prepared for Impact. But God has prepared Christians to make an impact in the world. And it's an impact so great that we continue to experience it more than 2,000 years later. And of course, uh, as you remember from the, back in the beginning of this series, that impact, that first impact, was Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter Sunday, when a group of women went to the tomb where the body of Jesus had been placed late Friday after it was taken down from the cross. And they went to that tomb early Sunday morning to complete the burial customs. And to their surprise, they found that the stone that had secured the opening of that tomb had been rolled to the open position. And inside, an angel of the Lord appeared and explained that Jesus wasn't there. He had risen from the dead just as he told his disciples that he would do. And so the empty tomb was the first way that God prepared the followers of Jesus to impact the world. It was the empty tomb that helped them to realize that Jesus was alive, that he had defeated the power of sin and death. Well, God also prepared the followers of Jesus to make an impact through the appearances of Jesus. And so if you remember, after the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday, for 40 days, he would appear just randomly to people in his resurrected body, that it was not bound by time and space, and he would just appear to two walking on their way to, a, to the town of Emmaus. He appeared and started walking along with them. Or with the disciples gathered in, in a, a room together, he appeared to them more than, than once. And Paul says that even within that 40-day period,
period, he appeared to a group of 500 at one time. And so he would appear during those 40 days. And it was through those appearances that God was preparing the followers of Jesus to make an impact in the world. Why? Because they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was alive. That he had defeated the power of sin and death. And that he was alive. And then it was through, then through the ascension, God prepared his followers to make an impact in the world because his disciples saw him bodily raise up into heaven until they could see him no longer through the, through the clouds. And it was through that ascension that they realized he was returning back to the Father where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, even now, to intercede for us. And then later on, 10 days after that, uh, uh, it, it, God prepared Jesus, uh, the followers of Jesus to make an impact by sending the Holy Spirit. Pastor Tracy preached about that. They, God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and, and, and those who have, you know, if you've surrendered your life to, to Jesus Christ, you have seen what He can do. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit of God fills your life when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and He changes you from the inside out. He changes your, your desires to want to do what God wants you to do more than you want to do what you want to do. He changes your direction uh, of life, gives you the, the power to live for Him. And you know that it's real. You know that you have the power of the Holy Spirit and that your life is now a witness, a testimony for Him, a testimony of who He is and what He can do. And then uh, uh, last week, uh, Pastor Tracy preached about experiencing life together, this deep fellowship that we can have together through this common faith in Jesus Christ, this love that is shared, a sacrificial kind of love where, where we love one another in, a, in ways like Jesus loved us. And, and the point is not that God uses our lives to help one another, but also that as the rest of the world looks at the church, here's what they should People that are living an uncommon life, a life of, of love and care for one another that draws the attention of people and says, why are they like that? It's because of Jesus Christ. Well, today we're going to focus on the church in action and how God prepared the followers of Jesus Christ to make an impact in the world by being taking by taking action. God impacts the world when the church takes action. I want to invite you now, if you're able, please stand. <clears throat> I'm going to read from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. <clears throat> Each day he was put beside the temple gate the one called uh, the beautiful gate. So he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intently. And Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. But what I, what I, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. And then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look first at uh, some Jewish customs that we see being lived out here in this passage. And first of all, some of those customs were the times of prayer in the temple in Jerusalem. For the devout Jew, the times of prayer at the temple 
were morning, noon, and, and evening. Uh, morning prayer was any time from dawn to 8 a.m. Noon prayer was any time from 12 noon to 1 p.m. And night prayer was any time from 6 p.m. to sundown. Now what we see here in this passage is another prayer time, 3 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. But this, was, uh, this prayer time was part of the, the custom of the Jews. And we see these new believers in Jesus Christ continuing to go to the temple to pray. And as they went in one day, they met, they met a crippled man. According to biblical commentator William Barclay, in the Middle East, it was the custom of, of beggars to sit at the entrance to the temple, carried there, obviously, as this man was, by family or friends. He couldn't walk there on his own. He was carried there and sat there by the one of the gates going into the temple. And this was the reason why it was thought to be the best place because when people were on their way to worship God, they were more likely to be generous. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because love for God and love for people should go together. We see that in the New Testament. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, where the Apostle John write the, writes these words, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. You see here this connection between knowing God, loving God, and, and, and loving people. So the man who had been crippled from birth uh, wasn't, doing only, wasn't just doing only the customary thing. He was doing the smart thing. And the only thing he could do, to, it was the only thing he could do to survive, you know, to beg at the Jewish temple and to rely on the compassion of people who loved God. <coughs> However, <clears throat> he had been sitting there so long, imagine this, his whole life he was crippled. He had been sitting there so long that most people likely never saw him. He was just kind of a fixture. And they, they walked past him. He was the guy at the temple gate. I'd say the people rarely even made eye contact with him. He was down there sitting, and they were up there walking past. They probably rarely made eye contact. He, he was just the beggar, the panhandler, that they saw every day when they went through that gate into the temple. And I would imagine few people, if any, bother to really see him or know him. To really see his plight. To really see his pain. To really see the sadness in his life. The hopelessness that was a part of his life. Or to feel what it was like to have little or no status. You know, this whole status thing, most of us cannot identify with having little or no status. Why? Because you have people wherever you go that acknowledge you and recognize you and call your name and come over to talk to you. It happens at work. It happens in the community at the gas station or the store. You know, they call out your name. Hey, hey, how are you doing? So, you know, those Kroger shopping trips turn into half an hour longer than you planned on because why? You have some status and people are acknowledging you. And as much as maybe you don't appreciate it at the time, you can imagine what it would be like to have a little or no status where nobody knew your name. Nobody called it out. Nobody came over to see you. Nobody looked after you. Imagine what that was like. And that, that was true for him. You know, it's common for us to see people and sense that there is a need, but yet not really see them. You know how it is. You know, the family across the street or down the road from you, the person at work, a certain student in your class, uh, you know, you know what it's what it's like, you know, to sense that, that there's a need, but yet uh, you know, see people and sense that there's a need, but but yet not really see them. And that's what, what happened. Uh, that, that particular day, I should say, that happened that particular day. Uh, and, and day in and day out with most people that passed by this beggar at the gate of the temple. You know, the, the, the church 
in, in action is intended to make an impact. And on that particular day, here's these relatively new followers of Jesus. Now get your mind around this. It's not too long after Easter. It's not too long after the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God has been given to these followers of Jesus Christ, these apostles, Peter and John. It's not too long after that. They're learning to live into this life following Jesus Christ where they sense the leading of the Spirit and where they, where they see people like they've never seen them before. It's not too long into them living that out and experiencing that. And one particular day, as they're walking into the temple for prayer, the apostles, Peter and John, really see the man. They see his practical needs, and they see his deeper needs. Verse 4 tells us, Peter and John looked at him intently. Looked at him intently. They looked at him. They saw him. Apparently the beggar had his head down. And Peter said, look at us. Apparently he wasn't looking at them. He probably had his head down. Look at us. Peter said, I don't have any money. But I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus the Nazarene, get up and walk. And Peter reached out his right hand and, and took the man by the hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were healed and strengthened and a miracle happened. The man who had never walked, never stood on his feet, he's walking, he's jumping, and he's praising God as he went into the temple. And as he went into the temple, he was bringing attention to God. And, and, and people were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've seen this guy. He's the guy that, that's always sitting there. He's been crippled since he, he was born. What in the world is, is going on? And so they're, they're seeing this miracle right before their eyes. And they were astounded, Scripture says. God still miraculously heals people today. He still does. There are some who receive miraculous healings. I would encourage you to keep praying for that, for people you know that have uh, physical issues. Keep praying for that. But trust God to do what is good for that person and to do what brings glory to the name of Jesus. Trust Him to do that. Well, Peter and John saw the man's practical need they saw his practical need. They saw his need for survival, for money. Uh, but they also saw his deeper needs. And so they offered him Jesus. Get up and walk, Peter said. Get up and walk. Take, take my hand. And, and he took, uh, and, and, and this, this crippled man took Peter's hand, daring to believe in some small, uh, some, small some small way that Jesus uh, uh, was the one that he had, and I should say, he believed in some small way in Jesus, the one he had heard recently had risen from the dead. This is in Jerusalem <clears throat> where all this happened. Jesus had been risen from the dead not too long before that. There was a talk of the whole town. He, he's risen from the dead. He's not there. His body's not there anymore. People are claiming that they have seen him and all of that. This man had heard it, and Peter said, in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, gets down to specifics. This guy, who once been raised from the dead, in his name, uh, stand up and walk. And by the beggar reaching out with his hand, in some small way, he is expressing faith in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to take note, uh, take note of this. Who the man, who this crippled man put his faith in was more important than the size of his faith. It's more important than the size of his faith. What did Jesus say? If you had faith the size of a mustard seed and you ask me, and then he goes on to tell about what he will do. 
See, he's not saying, oh, you know, you need to have great faith. Just keep working, keep working it up, trying to get greater and greater faith. Now we do, we need to grow in our faith, no question about it. But he's not saying that it's the size of our faith that accomplishes, that he uses to accomplish anything. He says it's who we put our faith in. And he said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed in, in him, that would happen, things would happen. Now, the mustard seed was the smallest of seeds. How many of you plant gardens? Some of you, many of you do. Some seeds are really small. Tell me about the smallest seeds that you've handled. Radish. Carrots. Tomato. Petunias. Petunias, okay. Green, green beans. Those are, yeah, even those are smaller. I, I've, I've hung out with, with David Schramm a time or two, and when he plants seeds, he takes these tweezers. He pours them out, those real fine ones, and he takes tweezers and plants them because he knows what happens if you try to pick it up with your fingers. It's like, where'd it, where'd it go? I dropped it somewhere around here. Where'd it go? Small seeds. Jesus said, listen, if you have the faith as the smallest seed, and if you put our, we put our faith in him, then that's the important thing. And Peter and John saw the deeper needs of this man and offered him Jesus, and he reached out his hand with this, this smallest of, of expressions of faith, and God did the work. You know, we see people with genuine practical needs and God wants us to help them, that's for sure. But people also have deeper needs that only the Lord Jesus Christ can meet. He can do the greater thing. He can do, he can make the impact in a person's life that is lifelong, not just temporary, not just a temporary help that often, that's the only thing we can do. He offers the great impact, the lifelong kind of impact to meet those deeper needs. You may remember a, a news story about a, a reporter in Columbus, Ohio, who uh, met a panhandler by the name of Ted Williams. I think it was back in 2016. And, and Ted Williams became a media sensation over, overnight. Do you remember this picture? He, he, because he was, he was labeled the man with a golden voice. And uh, uh, the, the YouTube video of him went viral with over 18 million hits on, on that video. The reporter that, you know, met him and, and helped him, um, you know, it was great. He, he was, you know, helping meet, meet some needs there for, for Ted. And, and then because of the video and the exposure that Ted got, lots of other people reached out to him and offered him jobs and, you know, and, and all kinds of practical help to get him back on his feet and all that. He had actually been, Ted had actually been a, uh, 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 a, a news anchor and things like that before, a re reporter and so forth years before, ended up, you know, uh, on, the, on the side of the road panhandling. But he received all this practical help. He was eventually offered a job with the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team and became an announcer for them. And he was also offered several other radio broadcasting positions as well. He was offered and given lots of practical help, more so than most people. But you know what happened? Sadly, his former ways got the best of him. And as of 2021, he was homeless again. Here's the point. We meet all kinds of people who need our help and we should help them. But what if what they're asking for isn't all they need? What if what they're asking for isn't all they need? If they haven't yet experienced the life-changing love of God through Jesus Christ, they need more than practical help. They need Jesus Christ. The crippled man healed in the name of Jesus drew a crowd in the temple and, and Peter saw the opportunity to offer Jesus to the crowd. And uh, the, the passage that follows what we read earlier talks about 
G, uh, Peter offering Jesus to the crowd that gathered. Acts chapter 3, starting with verse 12. Peter saw the opportunity and addressed the crowd. He said, people of Israel, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to the servant Jesus by doing this. Uh, this is the same Jesus whom you handed over uh, and rejected before Pilate, uh, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer, Barabbas he's talking about. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was willing, uh, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these, these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Peter saw the opportunity to offer the crowd Jesus more than just you know, to help them with their practical needs, he offered the crowd Jesus. I want to finish with this. Three things that are part of the church in action. We get it from what we've just seen here in this passage. Three things that are part of the church in action. First of all, see the people around you. See the people around you. Look intently at the people around you. Not in a creepy way, okay? Not in a creepy way, but look intently at the people around you. See them, friends, neighbors, fellow students, the people at sporting events that you uh, attend. See the people around you. Look intently at, you, at them. And as you see needs, secondly, do what you can do to meet those needs. And thirdly, don't stop there. <coughs> Offer them Jesus. Some haven't seen their, their need for Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Some have and are saved, but they've drifted away. And others are walking with the Lord. They just need some spiritual encouragement. See the people around you. Do what you can to meet those needs and offer them, them Jesus how do you do that? You know, uh, put, uh, take a three by five card, write, write his name on there, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hand people the card. This is offering them Jesus. No, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about saying things like, you know, seeing people, sensing that there's a need, and simply saying, How are you doing? How are you doing? My mom was, was good at noticing when something was troubling me, and maybe your mom was too. She knew when something was troubling me. And, 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 and she saw that there was some sort of deeper need there that she couldn't fix with a cure call or a fine lay or salve or food or whatever. She saw there was a deeper need there. And she said, are, are you okay? We can do that for other people. We can say, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Uh, we can meet. We, we can meet the needs that we can, and then offer them Jesus. <coughs> and we can also say things like, "Hey, tell me about your relationship with God. Tell me about that, because we know that Jesus is what." All of us need. Oh, there's all kinds of practical needs. But in the end, meeting those won't be enough. We need Jesus, don't we? We need Him. And so do others around us. And so we can say, tell me about your relationship with God as a way to give them a chance to talk about that. And then 
also encourage them wherever they may be spiritually. You know, it's through Jesus Christ that we'll find the greatest joy, that deep and lasting joy in our lives. And we see it in this man who entered the temple, leaping and praying and, and, and jumping, you know, walking and jumping. And he could have stopped there and just run out of the temple. But he didn't. He was praising God because he knew where his help came from. He saw, he experienced that God knew his name. And that Jesus had done something for him. There's no greater joy in the world than knowing that God knows your name and he reaches out to you. Offer people Jesus. Will you stand, please? <clears throat> oh Lord, we uh, uh, you know, are always amazed at who you are. And in this passage, we see you know, just the, the evidence, the reminder of who you are, that you care about our practical needs. You certainly do. But also that you see our deeper needs. And God, you want us to look at the world around us like that. And you want us to take action as the church to care for the practical needs of, of people, but to offer them Jesus as well. The one who is... Uh, you know, will be the, the greatest joy and help and strength in any person's life, the one who knows every person's name. God, help us to see those needs and to offer them Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen.